Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This talk is one that I did at my local youth church group thing. Essentially they have a youth service that I spoke at last week um, and so I wanted to share the talk on here but because obviously child protection I can't include the reading in this so I'm just going to do the reading quote for you. Before we get like properly into it, the talk was on the topic of breaking bread. We were looking at three passages, Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 47, Mark chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. So that's the one we're focusing on most and therefore that's the one I'm going to read to you. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 17 to 34. I'm reading from the NIV. In the following directives I have no praise for you for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come and eat together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are being judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not come in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further directions. So I'll take you back to my past self where we start the talk. Keep your Bibles open. Um, it was 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34, but we're gonna be looking at a couple of pastors as well. So bear with What was it that you missed during lockdown? Was it going out to eat? I definitely missed that. It was such a social thing for me. Was it coming to church or spending time with people at YF and meeting friends? Was it travelling, exploring new places? Or was it being able to go into people's houses and exploring and welcoming them into yours? I think there's something that underpins all of these scenarios. That thing, in case you hadn't guessed it, was community, friendship. Community is something we're all striving towards. It's something that we've all missed during these lockdowns, being on Zoom and not being able to meet together in person and just share a, share a meal and being able to be in one another's company. The passage we're looking at today links back to a passage that we're looking at over the next coming weeks. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And it's under the subtitle, The Fellowship of Believers. <coughs> today, we're looking at one aspect of verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Today we're, looking apart, today we're looking at a part of that verse that I probably wouldn't even usually look at. I'd usually focus on being in fellowship and prayer. But sandwiched, ironically, in between those two characteristics sits the act of breaking bread together. The reading that we had read to us from 1 Corinthians gives us a bit more of an idea about of breaking bread. We're going to break up what we're looking at today into three main sections. Firstly, what breaking bread represents, what happens when we break bread with an insincere heart, and then finally what happens when we break bread with genuine faith. Throughout this talk I'm going to be referring to three passages, Acts chapter 2, Mark chapter 14, and 1 Corinthians 11. This is the one we'll be referring to the most, so. but 
If you want to put your fingers in between the other ones, go for it. So what's the reason behind us breaking bread? If you look down with me at Mark chapter 14, we see the Last Supper. This is the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before he was crucified. It's the first time we hear about this meal taking place. And Jesus teaches us and the disciples the importance and the significance of the bread and the wine. Let's have a look at what Jesus says and what these two things signify. While they're eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to his disciples, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. His body and his blood. Obviously, we know that the bread and the drink are signifying these two things. However, they stand as a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross both in his body and his blood, for our forgiveness. <coughs> so, now, so now that we know why we break bread and what it signifies, let's have a look at the two attitudes that you can have when you come to that table, when we share in communion together. The first attitude is that that we see in 1 Corinthians 11, the passage we had read to us earlier. This attitude focuses on coming to the table with an insincere heart. We've just looked at the symbolism of the Lord's Supper. It points to the cross, right? Yeah. When Paul, the one who wrote this letter, wrote that in the Lord's, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are to do it in remembrance of Jesus. When you come to the Lord's table, are you coming in remembrance? It's a question to ask yourself. Or are you coming to the Lord's table merely knowing that Jesus existed, or that maybe he died for our sins? The point and the purpose of us coming together and sharing in communion with one another is to remember the preciousness of what happened when Jesus died and shed his blood on the cross. It's a loving memory. It's a thankful memory. It's not really a doubting memory. Now, I hope that doesn't seem exclusive. It might be hard to hear for some of you. But the Lord's Supper kind of is a bit exclusive. We, if we fully believe that Christ died on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sins, can come to the table with genuine faith in remembrance of Jesus' death on the cross. However, there will probably be some of you in this room who are not at that point, and that's okay too. The Lord's Supper signifies all that it is to be in Christ. It signifies our forgiveness through the cross. It signifies our salvation, the act of saving a person from sin. And it signifies that we will not be judged when Jesus comes again in the way that we deserve because Jesus took that death and that sacrifice on the cross. If you're not there yet, that's okay. But you do need to do something about it. The offer is there for you to be part of that family of believers. To the family where you are forgiven for all of the sin in your life. To the family where you have salvation where you are saved from your sin, and to the family in which you will not be judged on that final day of judgment. The offer is there for you, and it's up to you to accept it. The offer of forgiveness, the offer of salvation, and the offer of freedom from knowing that you will not be judged. It's there, and it's your choice whether to accept that or not. Secondly, what happens when we come to the table to take part in fellowship with a genuine faith? We see it back in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. It says, They broke the bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. When we spend time in fellowship and community with one another, it gives the world a reflection of Christ. When we see people coming together, Sharing food, we get a glimpse into Christ's hospitality and love in welcoming everyone in. The fellowship, the coming together of believers, shines a reflection on the world about the different characteristics of Christ. Hospitality, love, caring for one another, serving one another, welcoming everyone in. We love others because first, Christ loved us. So for those of you who have that genuine faith, Open up your homes. Share a meal with someone. Love them in such a way that they question why you're being so nice to them. 
We're called to live lives that are distinctive from the rest of the world, just like Jesus did. So as we move into a bit of a time of response, I'd like you to ask yourself these questions. If you close your eyes, just so you can think about them. Which attitude do you come to the table with? Is this a genuine faith, or have you got a bit of an insincere heart? Secondly, if you are coming to the table with a genuine faith, take a minute. Listen to, say, listen to what God is saying, and think about how you can distinctly love the people around you this week. What does that look like for you? And thirdly, if you're coming to the table with an insincere heart, think about the offer that the Lord's Supper offers. The offer of forgiveness, the offer of salvation where you are set free from your sin, the offer of no judgment, no matter what you've done in your life. So just take a minute. encouragement to you I hope you can leave with some questions um, yeah I hope you enjoy and subscribe down below um, I really enjoy doing these talks um, obviously I'm in my third year so I am busy but never too busy for good um, so subscribe down below for a bit more content like this from me and I will see you soon